Welcome to Foundational Bible Teachings. Here at Frank's Bible Study, we go in-depth in God's Word, making sure we know what it is and not what we'd like it to be. 2 Timothy 2.15 Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Let's go. So I'd like to welcome uh, everybody for tonight's Bible study. Last week we were looking at uh, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 12. I'm just going to read it fast for you. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry. And we started examining the edifying of the body of Christ and what that meant. Uh, so today I'm going to continue with the edifying. Um, Dictionary.com says edifying means to uplift. 1913 Webster Dictionary says edifying means to improve. So it's to uplift and improve. So edification is the building up in biblical knowledge instructing, improving the mind, character and morality of the believer, uplifting them to be better people for Christ, to be better ambassadors for Christ, for that's what we are. I want you to turn to Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 29. Here is going to be another example of uh, edification. Do not let any corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good for the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. The word communication basically means the act of imparting, conferring or delivering from one to another. So there's a communication going on. Right now it's communi the communication is coming from me to all of you. As the communication of knowledge, opinions or facts, conversation, intercourse by words, letters or messages. So Paul is saying, watch the words that pour out of your mouth. Ask yourself the question, will it ultimately edify the hearer? Now the word minister, um, again to repeat the verse, that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearer. The word minister means to give or to supply. So when you're edifying, you're giving, you're supplying. In this case, grace to the actual hearer. And grace, what does that mean? The seventh definition means spiritual instruction, improvement, and edification. So let me reread Ephesians 4.29 with these definitions now. Do not let any corrupt words proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good for the use of improving or uplifting, that it may give or supply spiritual instruction unto the hearers. I just put this, the verse in just different words. Okay? I'd like to look at another point in this verse. What did Paul mean when he said, Do not let any corrupt words proceed out of your mouth? Now the definition of uh, the word corrupt I got it from vocabulary.com. If someone or something is corrupt, they are broken morally or in some other way. Corrupt people perform immoral or illegal acts for personal gain, without apology. Corrupt politicians, for example, take bribes and deny it. When you corrupt someone, you convince them to do something wrong or even illegal. So example, if you talk to your little brother into stealing cookies from the cookie jar, you are corrupting him. You're using your words to corrupt him. So to go back to the verse now, do not let any corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Make sure that the words that you're using, you're not taking it that the person following your instructions, whatever it is, you're going to be debasing him. You're going to be uh, pulling back his character. You're just going to make him a meaner, debased person. That's not what the words are supposed to be there, especially if you're in Christ, especially if we are ambassadors of Christ. So corrupt communications is enticing the hearer to do some immoral act. You are using your words to debase the person you are talking to. And by debasing, I mean the second definition, to reduce or lower in quality, purity, or value. Everybody has a certain value. The minute you start corrupting this person, you start devaluating him. Uh, to adulterate, to ultimately render that person a useless human being in the eyes of society. A biblical example of corrupt communication is found in Proverbs chapter 1. So I'd like for you to turn to Proverbs chapter 1. We'll be reading verses 10 through 19. Verse 10. My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. The author here is strongly advising not to follow the path that uh, he would be introduced to by his friends. Look at verse 11. If they say, come with us, let us lay in wait for blood, let us lurk privily for the innocent without cause. 
Let us swallow them up alive as the grave and whole, as those that go down into the pit. We shall find all precious substance. We shall fill our houses with spoil. Cast in thy lot among us. Let us all have one purse. This is corrupt communication, which will not edify but destroy the character of the hearer of these words. The author, in verse 15, now provides edifying words. Again, words that will build up a person, especially in an intellectual or moral way. Words that would improve the hearer's character. Look at verse 15. My son, walk not thou in a way with them, refrain thy foot from their path. For their feet run to evil, and make haste to shed blood. Surely in vain the net is spread in the sight of any bird. And they lay wait for their own blood, they lurk privily for their own lives. So are the ways of every one that is greedy of gain, which taketh away the life of the owners thereof. The words used in this particular conversation in Proverbs 1 shows who is edifying and who wants to corrupt. Again, going back to Ephesians 4.29, do not let any corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, like we just finished reading in verses from 10 to verse 14 in Proverbs, but that which is good for the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearer. So the guy who's answering, he's ministering grace unto the hearers by telling him, guys, don't do that, but this is what you should be doing. This verse is an example of the work of the ministry. A believer does basically using the words to build his neighbor. You're using words to build him up in character. When you're witnessing to somebody, when, when, when you're basically giving words of encouragement, um, sometimes an edification might be a reproof. You might be pointing the fingers and say, you know what, you shouldn't be doing that. Because that also is an edification because you want that person to be morally better. You want to build up his character. So these different teachers are there to instruct, preach, teach, exhort, reprove, rebuke, Edify and build up the believers who make up the church, which is the body of Christ. That's what these guys are there for. When you walk into a church, the preacher, teacher is speaking, and there's no change. You walk in, and you walk out the same way you walked in. You basically wasted your time. Go play golf, go home, sleep, do something else. Because what did you get as an instruction? I remember in some of the places I've been to, I would walk in, I would get out of there charged like they plugged me in 600 volts. I would learn something, I would get excited, that would be the only thing I'd be thinking about for the next week. Now question, what's another reason Jesus institutes these five offices through Paul? So let's reread Ephesians chapter 4 verses 11 through 14. And he, Jesus Christ, gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. The words these five offices lay down. Whoever holds these offices, whatever words comes out of their mouths, and the words that they lay down in the ears of the hearers will be of one mind. There's one thought coming out, whoever it is around the world. Whatever they're speaking, they're all speaking on the same level. And basically, they're going to make us, all of the believers, the body of Christ, of one mind. Meaning, no matter where geographically they are spoken, will all be in accordance to what Paul laid down in his letters. Verse 13, Till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. To be in the unity of faith means to be in the unity of doctrine, biblical belief. There is only one truth. The Bible is one truth. And I'm going to be covering this probably not today, maybe next week, and I'm going to be getting a little bit more on how to basically go find it. Now question, is this what we have today? Absolutely not. Do we have the unity of the Spirit? Do we have unity of mind? Are we all of one mind, of one accord? Absolutely not. And how do I know? When you start off and start naming all the different denominations, start off with the Roman Catholics, you've got the Jehovah's Witnesses, you've got the Mormons, you've got the Anglicans, you've got the Presbyterians, you've got the Lutherans, you've got the Baptists, you've got the Pentecostals, you've got the Oneness. I can go on and on and on. What did I just do? I just named a bunch of different teams, and what are these teams doing? Are they all working together? Absolutely not. They're all butting heads, because they're all pointing the finger to everybody. You guys are wrong, we are right. You guys are wrong, we are right. You guys are wrong, and we are right. That's the body of Christ? To me, that's a sick body. That is a sick body. 
the body cannot operate and that's why Satan is having a heyday when they're gonna come to the unity of the faith when they're gonna come and understand the scriptures the way that they were written you read the scriptures the way that they are written you don't inject your bias as you're reading the minute you do that you just corrupted yourself and you're never gonna come to the knowledge of that truth how many times did I have to change a belief system that I had? Because while I'm reading, I'm like, hey, wait, I never noticed this. Or I might be speaking to somebody, and all of a sudden, my friend here says, yeah, but Frank, haven't you ever noticed this? Hey, wait a minute, I never saw that before. But if my pride, I'm hardened in heart that says, you know what, you're wrong and whatever, we have to agree to disagree. You go to your church, I'm going to go to mine. No, we are all part of the body of Christ. And those things ought not to be. So verse 13 again. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So to be in the unity of faith means to be in a unity of doctrine and biblical belief. So, is this where we're at today? Absolutely not. There's hundreds if not thousands of different groups or standings on different biblical doctrines. That's why there's thousands of churches blurring out their, quote-unquote, so-called truths. So everybody is true. So what's the definition of truth? If everybody is true, but they're all contradicting each other, is it the truth? If you've got two grams of brains, you're going to come to realize, no, it can't be. I'll give you an example. Jesus is God. No, he's not. He might be. Jesus is a plurality within a unity. Are you crazy? God is one. Can't you read? You need water baptism to be saved. Are you sure? Because I saw the opposite in the Bible. Leaves confusion. A lot of the people, I speak to a lot of people, the amount of people that are so confused, some of them are so scared even to, to approach the Bible or any church because they say it is so confusing, I don't know what to believe. In a way, I understand where they're coming from because back in 1984, 1985, that was my story, and my prayer was, when, when I came back from Fiji, I says, Lord, I know you're there, but where are you? What church, what Bible do I read? Those were my personal questions. And finally, when I came in, I got married to the Catholic Church. They did what they had to do. Um, it was a mess. I walked out, and I says, okay, Lord, I know that you're not in here. I want you to show me where I'm supposed to go. My prayer was, I will not set foot in any church. I want you to take me by the hand and guide me. Nine months later, I met a guy. I bombarded the guy with all kinds of questions. He did not have all the answers. But whatever answers he had, he says, Frank, this is the path. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by me. He says, this is the path. And make sure that you never step off of this path. Because if you step off of this path, you're going to end up on the broad way that actually leads to hell. And from there, he says, I asked him, what am I supposed to do to go to heaven? He explained to me that it was a gift. There was nothing that I can do for me in my hand to bring to God. You believe you're a sinner? I bowed my head and I said, yeah. You believe Jesus Christ is God? I bowed my head and I said, yeah. You believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ? I bowed my head and I said, yeah. One of these days I'm going to explain what my thought process was. But just to, to, uh, to summarize it, he says in your own words now, if you believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, confess with your mouth, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, and my friend, you're going to be saved, saved from the hell that you don't want to go to. And that's exactly what I did back in around July of 1985. That was my story. So, Jesus is God. No, he's not. He might be. God is a plurality within a unity. Are you crazy? God is one. Can't you read? You need water baptism to be saved. Are you sure? I saw the opposite. Now question, is this the unity of faith? I don't think so. I just gave you a couple of examples, and everybody is fighting on, 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 on some of the major doctrines here. So how can I find out what is? Biblically research out the matter, if it be so or not. Go to the Bible and check it out. Please check it out for yourself. Ask questions, compare. The answer is there. So, yes, I know that there's a confusion of church doctrines. It's so confusing. My thing was, Lord, guide me. But when something came up to me, I opened my eyes and says, okay, and I would go sit down and listen. I've been taught many wrong th things at the beginning, but it doesn't matter. I took it in. And as I walked, what was bad, I would take it out and take something new. And as I would walk, this was bad, this is coming in, this is going out. And that's why I keep saying, make sure 
the cement of your faith is constantly wet. At the beginning it would harden and it was very hard for me to change the beliefs that I had in the scriptures. But because my cement is wet now, it's a lot easier. I just take it out, I put it in, and I just fix whatever it is that I have to fix and I can keep on going. So question, is this the unity of the faith? I don't think so. How can I find out what it is? Biblically search out a matter if it is to be or if it is not. You go check it out. And you have to check it out for yourself. Ask questions, compare. The answer is there. Don't look at the confusion of, of the churches out there. Ask, ask God the question and watch how the answers are going to come. By the way, there's only one truth if you truly search for it. Yet we find thousands of truths out there. And this defies logic. As I already said, truth is exclusive and there's only one truth. And it doesn't fear examination. You think you have the truth? I have the right to sit down and question your supposed truth. You have the right to test or examine my truth. And remember, both can be right. Have you ever been in a church where you really couldn't ask any questions or too many questions? Why is that? I've learned that truth doesn't mind being questioned and that a lie does not like being challenged. I'm going to repeat that. Truth doesn't mind being questioned. I don't mind being questioned. I will take the time that I need. And a lie does not like being challenged. This has happened to me. i got a few places in my head that are coming to my mind right now where I would start asking questions and at one point I was shown the door. And I really wanted to learn what these people, where they were at. But the questions that I was asking, they couldn't answer because I'm asking and also pointing to other verses. Remember what Jesus did in the temptation? It is written. Satan would kind of tempt, tempt Jesus. And what would Jesus do? It is written. So when they would say something, but wait a minute, I saw something in the Bible. So how would you bring these two verses together? And when they couldn't answer, they basically as nicely escorted me out. When I ask a question that seems to challenge a belief or a doctrine, I'm searching for truth. If I'm asking somebody, this is me personally, if I'm asking a question, it's not to corner him. It's because I want to understand where you're coming from. Maybe there's something from my vantage point that I'm, I'm, I might be seeing wrong. So when you don't answer or you're bothered to answer, that's my cue to actually get up and leave. And that's what I'm, I'm actually suggesting. You're talking to somebody, they're bothered, they're not answering questions. Just get up and leave. Why waste your time? The five offices will all answer in the same way. It doesn't matter which office you're in. These people, these preachers, teachers, they're all going to be speaking in unison. They're all going to be speaking with one voice, with one answer, with one truth. Once this is accomplished, the believer in Christ stands sure on biblical facts. Now, yes, most of Christianity is in the shambles. But don't get me wrong. There's a lot of good preachers and teachers out there. It's just a matter of praying and asking God, where are these people? And if in the place where you're in, in the city where you're in, there's nobody, you start something. You pray and say, hey, Lord, give me the wisdom, knowledge, the understanding that I need. Instruct me, guide me in the way that I should go. You start something. Back to Ephesians chapter 4, in verse 14. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. In verse 14, Paul wants the body of Christ to be solid in its doctrines and belief and not to be blown away by fairy tales. I've had fairy tales hit this Bible study even a few years back. Back then I couldn't answer it. But then another one that hit me not too long ago, that person will get a phone call from me. I will sit down with him. Back then I didn't have the time, my wife wasn't doing too well, and everything else to store and whatever else that I had to do. But now that I do have the information, you disrupted a Bible study. You're going to have to contend with me now. You had the courage to come up and tell me that I was wrong. I was teaching a heresy. Right away I stopped my Bible study. It's 20 years you're saved. You should know something of the scriptures, right? So in verse 14, as we just read, Paul wants the body of Christ to be solid in its doctrines and belief and not be blown away by its biblical fairy tales. Notice also that the slimy pastor, teachers, evangelists, etc. were causing havoc in the church back in Paul's day. So this is not something new today. 
this has always been. Satan always put a seed. Where God is working, where God is, Satan will put a seed. He has to make sure that, that his little weeds come up and sort of like disrupt what's going on. So Paul is giving us a foundation on what to stand on. Paul's letters to the church is what we are supposed to be standing on. If you come across differing doctrines, do your due diligence to find out what is and isn't. That's your responsibility. Now, for myself, that's what I dish out. But what happens if you're in a place where the guy's not taking care of you? You're not really getting a good, solid teaching. Planting your feet on the floor and screwing your head straight on your shoulders so you know exactly where you're supposed to be going. Remember 2 Timothy 2.15, study for yourself. And Acts 17.11, search the scriptures for yourself. You are responsible for what you believe. Where did you get it from? That I never hear I got it from Frank? There I'm going to freak out. If I said something stupid, says I got this from Frank and you're still standing on it? And I real what did I say? But then I'm going to freak out in the sense that you actually believe what I said. You didn't go check it out? I just realized I made a mistake. Lord, please forgive me. What are you doing following me? What did Paul say? Be ye followers of me as I am of Christ. The minute you see me deviating just like a half a degree away from the Lord, guys, it's time to pack up and split the scene. That is your responsibility. Or you take me to the side and say, Hey, Frank, uh, you know what uh, you just finished saying there and you show me from the scriptures. And I should be humble enough to say, You know what? I'm sorry, I didn't see that. Sometimes I might say stuff that comes out of my mouth. Sometimes there, there's an attitude that I might have that shouldn't be there. It's not, it's not what Christ, it's not what Paul wanted me to walk in that particular way. And that's why we're there to help each other, to edify each other. Many preachers and teachers speak sweet and nice words, yet those sweet and nice words will eventually damn you. One of them coming to mind, yes, yes, uh, you pray and you accept Jesus in your heart and you're going to be saved. God wow. loves you just the way you are. Don't change. Wow. Really? So verse 14 again, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. What does the word slight? Uh, by the slight of men. The word slight means to trick. Men will trick you for them to come and get your money. Many salesmen, there's bad reputations out there, car salesmen, whatever salesmen, they're going to say anything for them to come and get your money. That's called the sleight of men. It's to trick you. Okay, sleight, E-I-G-H. That's right. And cunning craftiness. The word cunning, the fourth definition means deceitful, trickish, employing stratagems for a bad purpose. The fifth definition, assumed with subtlety. Subtle meaning deceitful. Cunning meaning shrewd, sly. So question, why did Paul say this? He saw the wolves in sheep's clothing making their way in the church. The snakes distorting the, the words of God. Basically, the yea hath God said society. Remember back in Genesis 3? Yea hath God said? Well, 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 well there's a, a group. There's a clan, if you want. And all these people are in there. Yea, did God really say that? So these smooth operating counterfeits brought in damnable heresies. Many believers back then, as it is today, were deceived into believing lies and doctrines of devils. As an example of these teachings, Paul wrote to Timothy, warning him about it. So turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. So let's start reading in verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, in that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. What does it mean to heed? It means to regard to give attention to. They shall depart from the faith, giving heed or giving attention to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. A doctrine is a teaching and devils are giving their teachings and they're trying to infiltrate it in the church. That's why the church is so wishy-washy today. Verse 2, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Now the definition of hypocrisy is a simulation. It's a feeling to be what one is not, to be somebody who you're not. A concealment of one's real character or motives, 
More generally, hypocrisy is simulation or the assuming of a false appearance of virtue or religion, a deceitful show of good character in morals or religion, a counterfeiting of religion. This is uh, Noah Webster. So the simulation, deceitful appearance, or false pretense. Example, our friendly neighborhood Pharisees and Sadducees. I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 16 and verse 6. Then Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Turn to Luke chapter 12 and verse 1. The reason we went to chapter uh, Matthew chapter 16, 6 is to show you when he says, take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. In Luke, only the Pharisees are basically mentioned. So Luke chapter 12, and we'll be reading in verse 1. In the meantime, when there were gathered together an innumerable multitude of people, insomuch that they trod one upon the other. And he began to say unto his disciples, first of all, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. What does that mean? What did Jesus mean by leaven here? The word leaven, second definition, anything which makes a general change in the mass. A general means something which corrupts or depraves with that which is mixed in. The Pharisees and Sadducees added doctrines, teachings to the Bible or to God's word that were never intended for man to follow. I'll translate this in today's language. The preachers and teachers added doctrines and teachings that never were intended for us, man, to follow. What lies in doctrines of devils was Paul talking about in verses 1 and 2? Go to verse 3 now. Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Now the Roman Catholic Church comes to mind here. Priests don't marry, and at one point, the Roman Catholic Church forbid the eating of meats on Fridays, substituting it with fish. One source back then that I had stated that the Vatican had shares in the fish stocks, thus pushing their no-meat policy on Roman Catholic believers. So they were bringing up the price of fish, and they were basically making money off of that. <clears throat> so verse 4, For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. If thou put the brethren in remembrance, now the brethren again is the believers, if thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. Now back in Paul's day, there was a wave of false teachings. And today, compared to Paul's day, we have a tidal wave of false teachings. It is crazy what's happening out there. And the people that have swallowed it, hook, line, and sinker, is beyond imagination. These false teachings were all infiltrated from the position of the five offices that God had ordained for the church. People who call themselves and are still calling themselves apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers are spreading their lies and deceit to all who are willing to sit and listen to these people. Today, the one who is truly searching for God and what God said and meant are very hard pressed to find out what those are. What are those things? Especially at the beginning of their walk with Christ. When somebody gets saved, they're hungry for the Word. That's what in Hebrews it says, desire the sincere milk of the Word. What does that mean? You're, you're so hungry, you just want to hear. You just want, you just want to hear of God. You want the teachings, but it has to be at the level where you're at. So a baby, when a baby is born, you give him milk. Then you start thickening the milk, let's say, with a bit of pablum. Then after that, from going a little bit hardened, let's say, milk, all of a sudden you're going to go to sort of like mushy food. And eventually you're going to start giving him hard food until he can actually take the hard food. There seems to be a minimum of two views of interpretation on many biblical teachings. Remember that. You believe something, there's going to be somebody out there that will believe the complete opposite. The confusion is incredible, especially with the advent of the Internet. And I've noticed a good bunch of sites that were mere opinions than actually diving into the teaching itself. They're just giving their, their two cents. On other sites, they teach on a subject not taking into account other verses that can alter the conclusion. 
you don't preach only on one verse because I can bring in another verse and all the conclusions you came to, I just destroyed everything. So question, how do I know who's telling the truth? One way is to make sure that the verse that was given to you to explain something or answer a question is in context with the passage from where it was taken. And a second way is to find parallel verses or passages to strengthen the first verse that actually was laid down. Remember, a text taken out of its context without its co-text is a pretext. What's a pretext? I'm glad you asked. A pretext is a verse devoid of its surrounding words or thought being conveyed, thus giving it another meaning that is foreign to the text or what the writer was trying to convey to the reader. So a verse taken out of its passage and or without other supporting verses or passage to show the proper meaning or understanding of it will incite an idea or thought foreign to what the writer was trying to convey. A pretext is a semblance of something that doesn't exist and something that God never said. He never said that. Churches are full of these storytelling fairy tales. Some 35 years ago, uh, a church in the States forbid men from wearing cowboy boots. And if you would, you would die and go to hell. Really? Could you please give me the chapter and verse on that? I wear cowboy boots. Am I going to die and go to hell? I don't think so. I don't think so. The Bible doesn't say anything remotely close to that. Unless you can pull a verse. And you better make sure that you're interpreting it right. First Timothy chapter 4, verse 7 and 8 now. But refuse profane and old wives' fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. Look at verse 8. For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is, and of that which is to come. This verse is used by many not to keep your body in shape or even go to a gym. The context here is works or deeds. It has nothing to do with you going to a gym. And yet, again, 30 years ago, I'm talking about 1988, this is what they were saying. Verse 3 gives the bodily exercise of what it is. That is, forbidding, forbidding to marry and abstaining from meats, which is a bodily exercise. You're exercising the body from not getting married or from not eating meats. That is the bodily exercise that Paul is talking about there in verse 8. Now, misapplying scripture is dangerous and inventing definition to words that is not in the meaning of the word is just as dangerous. It creates a satanic illusion of something that God did not say. Again, remember Genesis chapter 3. Satan comes in and both of them, between Satan and Eve, he, Satan is saying stuff, the other one is adding to what God said, and what happened? Here we are today, fallen man. So God did establish a system by which man may get acquainted with God, the creator of heaven and earth, but there's a problem. Herein lies the dilemma. And by dilemma, I mean a situation which is a difficult choice that has to be made between two or more alternatives. There are myriads of preachers and teachers in the churches out there. There's thousands and thousands all over the world. In different groups, on radio, on television, on the internet, in cult sex, and whatever rock you can find them under, they're all there. They all claim that they are of God, either sent by Him or called by Him. Now question. How can a person know who is truly of God and who is the wolf that Jesus spoke of? Properly answering this question will stabilize you on a firm foundation. So your job is to correctly identify which preacher, teacher, God has established among you and who is deceiving, who is the deceiving, cheating, lying viper. It's up to you to figure out what it is. Now this reminds me of an old TV program called Tell the Truth. This example that I got over here was from uh, May 1st, 1961. Three people at the beginning of the show would say, My name is Reg Evans, my name is Reg Evans, and my name is Reg Evans. Facts about the real Reg Evans would be mentioned, I guess at the beginning, and then a panel of four people had to figure out who the real Reg Evans was by asking as many questions as possible in 45 seconds. They would all turn and ask questions, and at the end of the question period, they had to guess who the real Reg Evans was. By watching one program, you will see that the two false Reg Evans would try persuading the panel that they were the real Reg Evans. The more the imposters fooled the panel, the more money they made. Could you imagine how much of a liar you have to be with a straight face? This was just a game. But there's another game called church. 
and the guy still with the same steel face is lying straight to you and you still don't see it. So this is exactly what is happening in the church today. The more the pastors fool the church, the more money they make. Remember, the panel only had 45 seconds to ask questions. But what about you? You have all the time in the world to check out who the preacher teacher is instructing you. Which table are you tucked under? Is this guy the real deal? What's his motive for him doing that? A preacher many years ago said this. One of the professors asked the question, how many here don't believe in God? And more than two-thirds of the, the hands went up. And at the end of the class, a friend approached his friend. He says, I noticed when the teacher asked, how many here don't believe in God? You lifted up your hands. He goes, what are you doing here? You know what he answered? There's a lot of money to be made in the God business. They know how to speak. They know how to make their, their sermons. They know how to deliver Bible studies. Do you know what it is? It's called public speaking. And if you're really, really, really good at it, I can suck anybody in. Because in the end, it's my pockets that are going to be growing. And we know a whole bunch of these preachers. In the churches, quote unquote, you have men and women who say, I'm a teacher, I'm a teacher, and I'm a teacher. It's up to you to ask the questions to make sure, are they the teacher? You guys already drilled me. And whatever I didn't know, I would go out. You're not sure. <laughs> you, you can ask more questions. Eh? Uh, you ask me the questions, and if I didn't know, I would try to go back and get the answers for you. Just like the TV show, you have to determine who the real teachers are. Your wrong guess can cripple you spiritually in the life to come, and in this world, miss out on what God had basically prepared for you. It's important who you're following. You, bold that and underline that, you have the heavy responsibility to identify and decipher which of these men or women who call themselves teachers are of God and who isn't. And at this point you might be saying, of these five teaching offices, uh, I have one or some of these men instructing and teaching me at the church where I go. They seem honest and genuine, thus I think I should be safe. Wrong thinking, boys and girls. Doesn't work like that. Wrong thinking. When it comes to spiritual matters, yes, there's a certain trust that you have in the person that's in front. Okay? But you cannot wholly 100% rely on them. We are all flesh and blood. Didn't the serpent seem honest and genuine in the garden when he spoke to Eve? It was a pretty nice conversation. But what happened? Look at where humanity ended up. Another example, didn't the disguise of the big bad wolf as grandma almost fool Little Red Riding Hood? Remember that story? If it wasn't for Little Red Riding Hood knowing certain facial features of grandma's face, Little Red Riding Hood would be no more and the story would never be told because she would end up in the wolf's stomach. So question, so then, how can you tell if a teacher or preacher instructing you is the real thing? By you knowing your Bibles. Read for the sake of reading. You don't understand. It doesn't matter. Read. This is what I used to do. I used to read. Lord, what does this mean? I used to write it down. And I used to wait for the answer. And the answer, believe me, it's going to come. Some answers took me a couple of years. But the answers will come. I didn't have a stock library. And my answers would actually come. Here's something on a radio, a pamphlet, maybe a book I was reading. Maybe reading another verse that God would illuminate me, says, okay, this verse goes with this one. Okay, wow, ding, ding, I think I just made the connection. By you knowing your Bibles and what it says, by knowing certain basic doctrines, just like Little Red Riding Hood did. As an example, seeing the wolf's eyes, Little Red went back into her mind and compared the eyes she had in the memory, in her memory of Grandma, and comparing it to the eyes of the wolf in front of her. Then she said, what big eyes you have. And she did the same with the ears, nose, mouth, until it exposed the wolf. But what happened? Little Red Riding Hood had in her memory what Grandma looked like. If you have an idea of what the Bible looks like, and you have it in your mind, and somebody is saying something, and wait a minute, you're saying this, I'm going back in my memory, and it seems to be contradicting that. Let me go back, flip, flip, flip. There, you know what? You're a liar. Stories coming to mind. I used to work as a waiter. I remember this one Sunday, I ended up getting home, must have been about 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning. I was exhausted, so I came home, I had those couple hours of sleep. I ended up getting to church, and after, after the uh, service, I got called into the preacher's office. 
I was at the desk and the preacher was sitting in back of the desk and he was sort of like rocking back and forth. He says, yeah, Frank, uh, you know what? Uh, God's not happy with you. I'm like this. I go, what did I do now? Well, you know what the Bible says about, you know, strong drink and wine. You work in a place where you're pouring wine and these people go home drunk and you know that you have a certain responsibility. And he starts giving me a miniature sermon. And he's going on and on. I says, okay, so what am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to quit my job? Oh, I don't know. But you know what? If I quit my job, how am I going to pay my rent? Don't worry, God's going to take care of it. Now, out of experience, I've learned never to do that. He says this to me, and I'm there, oh boy, what am I going to do? And I saw there was a certain smirk on his face. I put my two fists on the table, and I looked at him, and I says, I think we have a desperate mean problem here. He goes, what? I says, uh, remember Nehemiah? I go, Nehemiah was the king's cupbearer. Oh, and by the way, it wasn't crushed grapes that he had in his cup. And God ended up using him to go back and rebuild Jerusalem, the walls and the temple, him, Ezra, and the whole gang over there. What are we going to do with good old Nehemiah that was a king's cupbearer? You know what that guy did? <laughs> That's a pretty good one, Frank. That's a pretty good... I got out of there disgusted. Because I read my Bible, this story came to mind. If it would have been somebody else that hadn't read the Scriptures... Let me go because I don't want God to get mad. I'm going to go quit my job and then you would have been in a load of trouble. How are you going to pay your rent? How are you going to pay your food? So with the story that I just gave you, because I was reading just for the sake of reading, this story came back to mind. Make sure that you have a daily dosage of Bible reading for yourselves. And you watch how the Lord's going to start using that. It is incredible. I'm going to stop it here. We're going to pick it up next week. And the question I guess I'm going to be asking you is, how do you know if the teaching coming to you are biblically sound? So we're going to look at that uh, next week.